Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our coming Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As mentioned at the start of the service, uh, today is a brand new church year as well as the beginning of a brand new season in the church year, a season which we call Advent. Now why do we observe a season like that, Advent? A child or a newcomer to the faith might ask a question like that, and I'll have to admit, I sometimes wonder about that myself. I mean, let's face it, we in, in this society that we live in, this culture, we live in this uh, Halloween to Thanksgiving to Christmas kind of culture. Therefore, Advent uh, just doesn't seem to fit into that routine, does it? And yet, nevertheless, here we are in this somewhat awkward, somewhat uh, out-of-place season called Advent. Well, you know, the thrust of this season called Advent is actually twofold. It not only points us back to consider the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, thus the reason we, we tend to have Christmas on our minds this time of year, but this season of Advent, it also points the people of God forward. That is, forward to Christ's second coming. Now with that in mind, have you ever noticed that it's very tempting, especially in the culture that we live in, to focus solely on the first coming of our Lord Jesus? That is, to focus solely on the celebration of Christmas. And again, why do you suppose that is? Well, friends, aside from the fact that merchants have a vested interest in keeping us focused on Christmas, from a theological perspective, perhaps it's because, well, that first coming of Christ is clearly seen, is it not, as a demonstration of God's great love for this world. And that's rather appealing is it not? I mean, everybody can rally behind that. After all, the Bible tells us that God so loved this world that he gave us that wonderful gift of his one and only son to be our savior from sin. And who can argue with that? Whereas the second coming of Christ, well, the second coming is usually tied to this idea of judgment. That he will come again, as we confess in the creed, to judge both the living and the dead. And consequently, that strikes terror in a lot of people's hearts. And that is not so appealing. And therefore easy to just put out of thought and mind. And I think another reason we tend to focus more on the first coming of Christ is because, well, since the first coming of Christ has already taken place there in the little town of Bethlehem, there really is no response needed on our part other than that of faith, right? But the second coming, the second coming, it still lies out there before us. Therefore, it calls not only for our faith, but dear friends, it also calls for our watchful readiness. And let's face it, the idea of actually having to do something, namely something like that of keeping watch and being ready, is not very appealing for most people. No, most people, and I would include myself in that category, we don't like to have to expend a whole lot of energy and effort in regards to spiritual matters. We, particularly as Lutherans, have just kind of assumed it's all been taken care of for us, which it has. 
But dear friends, regardless of whether it's appealing to us or not, the biblical reality is our Lord Jesus is coming again. And the wise person not only believes that truth, but the wise person is also doing something about it. And what exactly should we be doing about that? Well, our gospel reading here today, our Lord gives us a couple of important commands, if you will. The first one there is uh, in verse 34, where Jesus says, watch yourselves. Watch yourselves. And the other one is there in verse 36, where he says, stay awake. And I'd like to look at both of those uh, more closely with you here this morning. First of all, our Lord says, as we anticipate his second coming, watch yourselves. Other translations render it as be careful. Be on guard. Watch out. Beware. Dear friends, clearly our Lord understands how easily we can drift away from the one true faith if we are not careful and engage in activities and behaviors that completely ignore the reality of his return as judge. Therefore, it would certainly be good and very wise for us to take a look to examine how we live out our days here on this earth, to review the things on which we spend our time, our money, our energies, to ask ourselves the question, do my activities truly reflect what I say I believe as a child of God? You know, uh, filmmaker Walt Disney, it is said, was ruthless in cutting anything that got in the way of a story's pacing. He wanted his films to flow without any distraction that would cause the audience to drift from the main storyline. Ward Kimball, one of the animators for the Snow White movie, recalls working tirelessly for 240 days on a four and a half minute sequence in which, uh, well, the dwarfs made soup for Snow White and they nearly destroyed the kitchen in the process of making that soup. Walt Disney thought that scene was hilariously funny. He loved it. But in the end, he felt that it interrupted uh, the flow of the picture. And so out it went. He, he cut it out of the movie. Now, it certainly wasn't a bad scene. And in fact, arguably, it was quite good, quite funny, enjoyable. It's just that it wasn't the right scene for what Walt Disney was trying to accomplish with that film. Well, my friends, when the film of our lives is shown, will it be as great as it might be? Well, I suppose that will depend a great deal on the multitude of things, including those, quote, good things we need to eliminate in order to make way for the great things which our God wants to do through us. Our returning Lord says, watch yourselves. Watch yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down, he says, with things like dissipation, drunkenness, all the cares of this life. By the way, do you know what dissipation means? I got to admit, I had to look that word up. It means squandering away the energy, the resources that God has entrusted to us 
In other words, God desires that we use the gifts that he has given to us, you know, in his way. Not necessarily our way, but his way. So that we can both be blessed ourselves as well as a blessing to others. You see, life, it is to be enjoyed, but is it is not to be abused. It is to be treasured, but it's not to be clenched as though this is all there is and that there is no eternal kingdom of God. The other uh, thing Jesus gives us here as we anticipate his second coming is he says, stay awake. You know, if you think about it, that command implies there is probably going to be some sort of time interval between the Lord's first coming and that of his second coming. In other words, although his return could certainly be immediate, I mean even today, tomorrow, next week, it is more likely it's going to take place at some point later on. But at what point exactly is it going to take place? Who knows? Therefore, that is why Jesus warns us to stay awake, to keep alert, to be ready. But friends, let's face it. That can be a hard thing, can it not, for a person to do? I mean, waiting. Let's be honest. Waiting can be tough. Hey, I'm reminded here of the recent state uh, championship football game between uh, Fort Wayne uh, Dwanger and uh, Evansville Central. As you may know, that game, that game went into not one, not two, not three, but four overtime periods. A sports uh, commentator that I was listening to on the radio mentioned that following the Dwanger-Evansville game, there were two other teams who were scheduled to play for the 6A state championship. And he commented on how those two other teams were anxiously awaiting to take the field. But of course, they had to wait until the Dwanger-Evansville game had ended. And then he said this. I thought this was interesting. He said, it can be really hard for a coach to keep his team mentally focused when you have to keep waiting like that. You know, my friends, what is true for a a coach of an anxious football team is even more true for a pastor of a congregation. I mean, let's face it, so often, so often it seems like the world is going into one overtime period after another. And we get anxious. It's interesting to note how, you know, when the first Gulf War broke out, church attendance, it shot up. But then gradually retreated again. Same thing happened with the 9-11 terrorist attack. Shot up, then retreated again in the days after. And then again, that happened in 2008 with the Great Recession when that hit. In many ways, it's just like the pattern that the people of ancient Israel fell into during that period of the judges back in the Old Testament times. A bad thing would would happen in the life of Israel, which served as a reminder to them of the end of time and God's judgment upon them, which uh, led the people to see their need for God, to repent of their sins, to cry out to Him for help. God delivered them from their troubles. They then enjoyed a period of peace and security. But that peace and security often turned into a self-reliance which in turn led them to uh, forget their need for the Lord God, or worse yet, forsake Him altogether. 
Friends, our Lord Jesus here in the New Testament commands us, his followers, to stay awake. To not fall into that pattern where we turn away from the Lord. But how does our Lord motivate us to stay focused on him so that we don't get into that pattern? Well, here in our gospel reading, he not only provides us with a couple of warnings, but he also provides us with a couple of promises that help us to see that it is to our advantage to both watch ourselves as well as stay awake in these latter times. The first promise is actually something that we see take place right out in nature, which is that of the changing of the seasons. Now right now we are heading, of course, into the winter months. Don't let today fool you too much, right? These winter months in Indiana can often be challenging for us with snow and ice and bitter cold. But what keeps many of us going through those harsh times is that we know that better days will eventually come. Well, our Lord Jesus used a similar kind of illustration with the coming out of the leaves on a fig tree to illustrate that, well, just as summer is near with that happening, so also the kingdom of God is near. And think about that. Summer, of course, is, well, it's just the opposite of harsh winter. Summer brings longer days, happier times, pleasant refreshment, all creatures are renewed with summer. Birds, insects, worms that seem to have vanished or died over the winter months are brought to life again by the warm shining of the sun. In other words, the thought of the coming of summer is like that of the thought of the coming of God's kingdom. And it keeps us focused and energized, and hopeful, even in the midst of whatever hardships and adversities we might be facing right now. And then finally, the other promise Jesus gives to us here in this reading is in the form of a negative and a positive. The negative is, well, he tells us all material things, that is, all created things, will perish. Friends, the house, the car, the money, all the stuff we've accumulated over the years, the hobbies we enjoy, why even our cherished loved ones, all of it, our Lord says, will pass away. But the positive, the good news is this. The word of the Lord, which created it all, that is everlasting. And his word of promise, his word of promise of forgiveness and eternal salvation, that word will never pass away. The reformer Martin Luther, he summarized all that very well in his uh, famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, where he wrote, Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. Why? Because Luther says the kingdom's ours forever. Yes, my friends, today is the start of a new church year in a brand new season of that year called Advent. And you know, as we begin this new church year, this new season, well, let us do so with the end. The end in mind. Indeed, let us begin each and every day of our lives with the end in mind. By watching ourselves, staying awake, and above all, clinging to 
clinging through faith to the eternal promises of our coming Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen.